this is not just a national phenomena, it's a global phenomena that young people want to try to solve this problem. And I think they have the will and the capacity and the commitment to go about making the kind of changes that are necessary. And so the level of activism amongst young people across the globe is something that gives me hope. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with John Podesta. John is the founder and chair of the board of directors for the Washington, D.C.-based think tank Center for American Progress and a founder and chair of the board of Washington Center for Equitable Growth. He served as counselor to President Barack Obama, where he was responsible for coordinating the administration's climate policy and initiatives. John also served as White House Chief of Staff to President Clinton. In 2016, he chaired Hillary Clinton's campaign for president. John is a big thinker who knows how to turn his thoughts to actions and get things done. John, welcome to the podcast. There are a few people in Washington who have more experience in democratic politics than you and fewer who better understand government policymaking, how the sausage is made. But before we get to Washington, let's start with Chicago, where you grew up. Tell us a bit about your upbringing in Jefferson Park and how it shaped your interest and worldview and what inspired you to get into politics. Well, uh, that's a great question, Hank, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, you know, I grew up in a kind of typical blue collar household in in uh, in Chicago. My uh, father worked in a factory. My mother worked at night in a pink collar job. She was kind of political. Uh, it was the era of machine politics. Richard Daly was the mayor and and the boss of, of Chicago. But I really got inspired to get into politics through a different route which was uh, as a result of uh, my activism against the war in Vietnam. And uh, I was uh, a freshman, I guess, in college. Um, and Gene McCarthy announced his candidacy for president, uh, challenging President Johnson during the fall of 1967. And I was uh, excited to try to work on that, on that campaign, on his behalf and on behalf of the cause of trying to get the United States untangled from the Vietnam War. And I uh, left school and traveled across the country. It was the first time I'd ever seen the country, really. And the country wasn't as homogeneous as it is today. You know, it's not like a McDonald's on every corner uh, or a Starbucks on uh, on every other corner. Uh, so uh, I got to see a lot. I was I guess I was good enough at it that I, I stuck with it. And just very briefly, you know, obviously, uh, uh, he didn't win the nomination. Uh, I ended up dispirited at the at the famous Chicago convention in 1968, but not dispirited about the country or what politics could do. Uh, so uh, following that, I, I, I stayed involved. That's where I actually met Bill Clinton. I did a campaign in 1970 for uh, somebody you pr uh, probably knew, Hank, Joe Duffy, who was running for the Senate. Yeah. Uh, in a three-way race against uh, Tom Dodd and Lowell Weicker. And Bill Clinton was a young law student at Yale. Uh, and I, again, quit, you know, I left college for a little bit and went out to work on that campaign and we became lifelong friends. So, you know, you make some of your best friends in those campaigns too. Yeah. And, and you know, going back, it's a flashback to that era. You know, I graduated from college in 68 and, and grew up in Chicago. And boy, it's hard for people who didn't live through that to really understand. We talk about the turmoil today, but boy, I mean, you know, I was in college when people got shot at Kent State. I mean, this yeah. was this was a tough, tough time. Now, you spent a number of years in your early career on Capitol Hill. What was it like working on the Hill in the 80s? And what did you learn from those years? Yeah, we, it was extremely different <laughs> in the sense that you know, conservatives were really conservative. Uh, I, I spent most of my time on the Senate Judiciary Committee working for Pat Leahy. 
Strom Thurmond was the chair of the committee. We had people like Orrin Hatch and Paul Laxalt and, you know, Jerry Denton. They were, they, they were really conservative. And their staffs kind of reflected that. And I guess uh, so did the Democratic staff, which was pretty liberal. We had, you know, Ted Kennedy and Leahy and, and, and uh, uh, Howard Metzenbaum, people like that. But people got along, which is different than today, I think. The senators were friendly. They socialized with one another. They knew each other. Their uh, spouses knew each other. And the staff knew each other and socialized. And, and I have, you know, still have friends from that era who were, you know, we disagreed on politics, but, but we liked each other as people. And that meant you could work across the aisle. You could find reasonable compromise. And that really began to change, I think, in the 1990s in particular, with the rise, I, I, I attribute a lot of this to the rise of Gingrich in the in the House Republican Party. The Senate resisted for a while, but but uh, this deep division, this ultra partisanship, wasn't really a feature of the way the Senate worked back then. And every now and then, you see glimpses of uh, of the old Senate. People can can find ways to work together, but I I. I I fear, actually, that uh, we've lost the ability uh, to understand each other, talk to each other, and and, and find uh, common ground. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because people will sometimes say to me, well, gee, when you went to Washington in 2006, those are kinder, gentler times. And I say, what are you thinking about? You know, it was very acrimonious. I remember just the, the extent of the feeling there. And so it was, it, was, it was pretty tough then. Now it's gotten worse. Now, there's almost no job in Washington that's more difficult than White House Chief of Staff, where every major domestic, political, or foreign policy issue lands in your desk before it goes to the president. I think few people understand just what's involved in that. Talk about your experience as Chief of Staff, what the job entails, and what was it like working for President Bill Clinton? Now, the key thing to do that job well is to have a relationship, right, with the, with, with the president. And, and, and you mentioned you began to form a friendship with him a long time ago. But talk a little bit about that job and how it worked. Well, you know, you're you're the uh, nation's chief air traffic controller. You know, <laughs> there's so many moving parts to the federal government, to to policy making, to foreign policy, to national security policy, and the you know, Jim Baker always said the most important word in chief of staff is staff, (laughs) your staff to the president. You know, you, if you get a big head about it, a big ego about it, you're not going to do a very good job. So you've got to be a leader uh, of the team that's in the white house. They're incredibly smart and dedicated people. there. they are people who really believe that they're trying to make the country a better place and the world a better place. And that's, that's a good thing. And uh, the dedication of the White House staff is, is you know, really inspiring. Uh, but you also have to have that relationship with the president. You have to be able to say no. You have to speak, you know, the famous expression, speak truth to power. You know, in President Clinton's case, it, he was someone who knew something about everything, literally everything uh, from sports sports uh, and uh, to politics, but deep, deeply engaged in policy. And sometimes he wanted to do things that uh, from, from policy perspective, they were a little bit crazy. And yet, you know, you had to say, uh, no, Mr. President, that's not going to work. And um, we had a pretty respectful relationship. He yelled at me, I yelled back. And uh, but he's a lot of fun. And always, um, he'd always kind of drive deep into uh, into policy, but with the conviction, and I think it was really uh, why he was successful as a politician, with the conviction that if he got the policy right, it made a difference for people that he kind of basically grew up with, you know, in, in a small town in Arkansas, the kind of people who needed the government to be on their side. He got that and he'd relayed everything back to what was what was that mission to improve and give people opportunity and and give them the chance uh, to lead good lives. And I think that's what 
motivate him when he closed the door in the Oval Office. And, you know, it was always kind of um, fun to see his mind spin because, you know, he was a broad, horizontal thinker. He could bring a lot to bear. And, you know, you've you've interacted with him, Hank. He's just, he's just curious about a lot of different things. And that made my job maybe a little bit harder because I had to know a lot about a lot of different things. But it also made it more fun. And you just hit on what I was going to say, because he had this great intellectual curiosity. And, you know, there weren't a lot of brief conversations with him. And so I think one of your challenges was right was keep things moving on time, <laughs> because because he you know he, he sure didn't rush. He was famously late. I had the other situation when I worked for for George Bush, right, as president, because everything started right on time. Yeah, exactly. But but, but, uh, but yeah, Obama. You know, I I later had the privilege of working for President Obama in the White House too, and he was much more like if the meeting was called for ten. He'd show up at ten. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was yeah. not. That was not. Uh, of all of Bill Clinton's great strengths, being timely was not one of them. <laughs> yeah. sure was. Now, you also worked with uh, with his wife, Hillary Clinton, you know, as chair of her presidential campaign. It's different working for Hillary. What was it like working with Hillary? Yeah. Well, again, she's wicked smart, uh, like the president. But she's different in the way I think she approaches a problem. She's more analytic. She's more logical. She's more, and I've used this expression before, and maybe just use it before in this, in this podcast. Bill Clinton thinks horizontally. That is, he can bring information to bear that is coming out of nowhere. You know, you'd be talking about healthcare in the United States, and he'd tell you a story about the structure of small business in Northern Italy, but bring it home to be applicable uh, to the problem that was at hand. Uh, Hillary was more and is more kind of logical, deep. She studies extremely hard. She always comes prepared. Uh, she's, uh, she's more the trial lawyer and uh, President Clinton's more the law professor, <laughs> you know, I mean, kind of, uh, and, and so the, they're different and they're complementary. Um, and I think that's why they kind of enhance each other a, a, a little bit because they're not the same in, in style, uh, notwithstanding they're both like, as I said, you know, brilliant people. And John, the interesting thing about you and what makes you and others like you who are successful in Washington successful is you can work with different types of people, right? And that's a key. It's, it, it was a, it's a key in investment banking. It's a key in a lot of things to, to, to understand. I mean, I knew when I went to Washington that I could have a, a discussion and a, a quote, a deal with President Bush before I arrived. But if it didn't work, it was going to be my fault, not his. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was my job to figure out how to make that work. And that's, I, I think, your experience on the Hill and all your earlier politics allowed you to do that. And that's, that's a key. If I could uh, say one thing about that, Hank, and I, and, and I mean this uh, sincerely about you, and I mean it about in, the most important attribute is basically knowing that you're not going to be deceptive and you keep your word. If you can have a reputation for being straight with people and, and they know that you keep your word, then you can get a lot done in, in, in business, in politics. And I think that's always been something that, I, you know, I've really tried to practice. For sure. And it makes a big difference. Now I want to get to another aspect of Washington. So you're the founder of two important D.C. think tanks, the Center for American Progress and Washington Center for Equitable Growth. First, for our listeners who don't spend a lot of time in D.C., explain the role of think tanks in the policy world, why you decided to found these organizations, what were you trying to achieve, which I think gets to your theory of change. Right. Well, um, you know, uh, Think tanks have had a very long history. Brookings Institution just celebrated its 100th anniversary. It is a place where one can do policy experimentation, analysis, 
uh, provide uh, decision makers with the uh, research that's necessary to come up with good policy design uh, and increasingly communicate that to the public uh, to basically be prepared to be out trying to argue for a direction in, in, in policy and, and, and politics in the country. And uh, I started the Center for American Progress, which is now the largest progressive multi-issue uh, think tank uh, uh, in Washington and, and in the United States. Um, uh, because I, the, it's, it's interesting, you know, this was back in 2003, and I, I don't think anybody was waking up in the morning thinking what Washington really needs is one more think tank. Uh, but the reality was that um, the conservative, uh, conservative philanthropy had invested a lot in these in uh, conservative think tanks. They were they came in different flavors, uh, from the Cato Institute to Heritage to American Enterprise Institute. You know, some more pro business, some more uh, libertarian in their in their outlook. But uh, I think that uh, conservative philanthropy saw the value of making those investments to try to influence. Uh, policy at the national level, tried to influence uh, essentially the kind of uh, uh, ideas and policy prescriptions the, that would be uh, raised in the context of, of campaigns and then implemented by presidents and, and, and the Congress. And on the left and center left, uh, there was just as much money being spent, but it was it was deployed in a different way, much more through single issue organizations, advocacy based organizations, and indeed at the, it in uh, in the early part of uh, of that decade, um, the Democrats didn't have any uh, instruments of power. They lost control of the Senate. They had lost control of the House. Uh, President Bush was in was in office. And uh, the ability to kind of generate a new uh, sort of governing philosophy, set of ideas, approaches uh, to governance that could be politically salient uh, in a presidential campaign uh, or uh, be implemented once in office was, was uh, in my mind, missing. So we started the Washington Center, uh, the Center for American Progress. And, uh, uh, and it's grown and, uh, and prospered, and it's been a place that uh, has, I think, had a lot of impact and effect uh, on the Obama administration, on the Biden administration, on, on, on Capitol Hill. And it's generated a lot of uh, young talent that have now gone in to serve uh, in, uh, in the White House and in, in government uh, on Capitol Hill. So I think I'm very proud of it. I think it's been very, very successful. The Washington Center for Equitable Growth proceeded from, uh, and I, by the way, I did both of these uh, institutions with two people who became very, very close friends of mine, Herb and Marion Sandler, who I think you knew, uh, Hank, they, they were, uh, had run large financial institution on the West Coast, but they were basically liberal philanthropists um, who were, who were kind of into ideas. Uh, and um, we were kicking some problems around. And one, one of which was the fact that there was a presumption that you could create more equitable solutions for the uh, for the population as a whole, but you did it at the expense of growth. And so the you can have a smaller pie that was more fairly distributed. Um, and I kind of thought that was wrong and they sort of thought that was wrong. Uh, and it wasn't what we were preaching uh, to developing economies. But it, it, it stemmed from, uh, there was a famous book written by Arthur Oaken in the 1970s called Equity and Efficiency, The Big Trade-Off. And I think we were of the view that there was no uh, trade-off, that a more equitable economy actually had the advantage of producing a stronger middle class, stronger growth patterns, and a bigger uh, overall uh, pattern of growth for the, for the total economy. Um, and so, uh, uh, but there was a presumption going the other way amongst, including amongst Democrats and liberal economists, et cetera. So we started that think tank with, uh, uh, and convinced a woman named Heather Boucher, an economist uh, who ran it for 
a number of years, now serves on the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, to work with academic economists to do evidence-based research to say what, what does inequality do to growth and what do fair, uh, a fairer tax system, more enforcement of antitrust to reduce monopolies, et cetera. And again, it's now in, uh, it's been around for about a decade and I think it's produced extremely important research that really is at the heart of what uh, Biden's economic program is, which is a, a, a strong focus on equity as a means of creating a stronger and more sustainable and stable economy. And John, one of your enduring contributions is also all the young people that you have mentored and, and uh, helped with, your, with their careers. And you, you see them throughout the government today. And uh, I think both of those think tanks were, were vehicles to do just that. Now, now what I'd like to do, John, is talk about climate change. You know this topic as well as anyone, and you've worked for a long time and very hard to combat climate change. Give our listeners a sense of how you view this challenge and what are the biggest risks that you see here? Well, you know, I think people are now experiencing it every day. It's not something that's off in the future. Uh, we see it in the, in the fires in the West, in the, in the uh, storms and extreme rainfall in the, in the Gulf Coast and on the East Coast, see it all around the world and floods in China and Germany, the uh, major uh, storms in, in, in Africa and Asia. Um, it is, I th in my view, the biggest security threat facing the human race. If you look at what all the peer-reviewed science suggests, the effect on human well-being, human security, from the impacts of not just extreme weather, but drought, the impact on food systems, water systems, on life in the ocean because of the uh, effects of the acidification from uh, the absorption of so much CO2. Across the board, this is the biggest challenge humanity is facing. And uh, I think the latest uh, report from the IPCC, which suggests what we need to do, which is to go by the middle of this century, which is only 30 years from now. I've been working on this for 30 years, so that doesn't seem like uh, that long uh, into the future. We have to go from a world and a, and a global economy that's based primarily still on fossil fuel energy to one that to a world which is net zero. That's an audacious challenge, uh, but it's also a huge opportunity uh, to uh, transform uh, the way we power our economy, uh, the way we build things, the innovation that comes from that. Um, and uh, it means that over the next decade, uh, the you know particularly in uh, the uh, developed world, in the industrialized world, we have to cut emissions in half on our way to that goal of uh, net zero by 2050. And um, it's, it seems um, like the level of change to do that is almost impossible to imagine. But then you, when you look at the policy instruments that can be deployed, you can see the path forward to go from coal fire and, and uh, natural gas fired power to renewable power from innovation in, in industrial processes to electrification of transportation, using uh, zero carbon energy as a, as a source for the electricity to power that. It's all doable if we have the will, the policy, uh, and the spirit to do it. Yep. And as you said, it's going to be the greatest industrial transformation in the history of the world. I mean, to have an economy, global economy, that's 80% reliant on carbon-based fuels and to get to net zero, this is going to take decades, as you said, you know, but it's going to be huge. Now, I want to spend more time on climate, but I need to ask you a related question because there's another challenge that doesn't attract the same headlines as climate, the climate crisis, but in my view, is every bit as alarming. 
and that's the collapse of global biodiversity. The forests, the wetlands, oceans, birds, animals, and insects. This is an issue you spent a lot of time thinking about. So tell our listeners about how the nature crisis relates to the climate crisis and how do you view the risks of biodiversity loss? And how do our policies need to change to protect our natural capital? Well, they're linked, but they're different. And, uh, I, and, and Hank, I applaud you for spending so much time on this conservation challenge because uh, in the end of the day, the, the, that biodiversity provides the, um, all of the natural capital that we need to live uh, not just the beauty of the world, but the but the but the the physical capacity to kind of um, uh, to, to survive in a world, and we're facing we're facing uh, a moment where there's predictions that uh, about an eighth of the species of the planet will go extinct by the end of this century, <laughs> and uh, that is a combination of the effect of climate change and the, the effects climate change are having on individual habitats. But it's more than that. It's the overall pattern of development, uh, you know, tearing down a forest in, in pursuit of food production, etc. It's the impact on the oceans that I mentioned from not only acidification, but from ocean pollution, the effect of plastics being dumped uh, into the oceans. So we're really, we're really in a bad way. Uh, and I think that's, you know, not only is that something that is, uh, as I said, needs direct uh, intervention by uh, both national governments, but also by the global community. Uh, we're going to have a meeting of the Convention on Biodiversity, one of the other treaties that the United States has been unable to ratify, even though we were probably the primary proponent behind it to try to salvage and save a rich and diverse uh, world. But I think a first step is something, again, that uh, countries have uh, taken the step towards. I think there's more interest in, in, um, in the footprint of, of companies who are engaged in utilization, sustainable utilization of resources, food production, et cetera. And that is to protect there's a goal that will be put forward uh, that the U.S. government has now embraced under President Biden to protect 30 percent of our lands and waters by 2030. I've been involved with both President Clinton and President Obama in uh, doing large landscape uh, preservation through the using the Antiquities Act, creation of monuments, et cetera. Some of the most uh, fun and exciting work that I've had the pleasure of doing. But it really goes much deeper to how communities protect their biodiversity, how we build sustainability uh, and adaptation into a climate stressed world. And um, it gets less attention than climate change, but I think it's just as big a crisis. It sure is. And one way I look at it is distressing and, and climate change is really a, a distressing, a, a huge uh, threat. And scientists have done a lot of work and they understand a lot more about this than they do biodiversity loss. Because yeah. I think as we're looking at what's happening to the global ecosystem, that we don't even know enough to know what all the risks are. I think when you get mother nature out of balance. One thing you said that resonates with me, really resonates with me, is, you know, we both work on sort of policy issues and big, difficult policy issues. And the great thing about working in conservation, when you can, you can actually see the results when you protect land, right? Now that's <laughs> exactly. just something really, really tangible about that. So it's, it's nice to win some. And uh, so, but, but let's now get uh, back to climate change. Because during the Obama years, you were a key player in negotiating the Paris Climate Agreement, and you played an essential role in bringing China into the agreement. So talk about that agreement. What were its aspirations, its strengths, its shortfalls? What did you learn from these negotiations? And how can those lessons be applied in Glasgow this fall when policymakers meet for the uh, COP26 climate summit? Well, I think fundamentally, the change of thinking between the global architecture for dealing with climate change went through a profound change 
in Copenhagen uh, at a cop that was viewed as unsuccessful, disappointing, et cetera. I remember but, the Chinese walked out of it, right? Well, they, 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 there was a famous meeting where uh, President uh, Obama and Secretary Clinton stormed into a room where the Chinese and the Indians yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, the Brazilians it. were meeting. And, but uh, it changed the sort of architecture and recognized that a kind of one size fits all solution didn't work, that you needed to you needed to take account of individual national circumstance for the building blocks of ambition you had to do nationally determined uh, commitments and that there was pressure to constantly ratchet up the ability of countries to do more through understanding what they were going to pledge to do to keep global pressure on enhancing ambition and then holding people to account uh, to the pledges that they made. And I think one of the keys to the successful outcome in Paris was about a year before the meetings in Paris and the agreement on that, that overall architecture, uh, there had been uh, quiet negotiations that had taken place beginning with Secretary Kerry, uh, who's serving uh, as the special envoy for President Biden now. Uh, and then myself as the White House lead on cl uh, climate, Todd Stern, who was at the State Department, uh, at the time with the Chinese to come forward with a joint announcement between President Obama and President Xi in Beijing, which stated what we would both do, what the United States would do in its nationally determined commitment and what China would do. And I think we surprised everybody because both of those commitments were seen as ambitious at the moment. And uh, it galvanized the discussion. Uh, I think it meant that other countries came forward, including some places that were more surprising, Mexico. Uh, you know, obviously the European Union had been pushing forward uh, aggressively uh, on the climate file, but other people fell in line and tried to lift ambition. So that was the strength of it. It was a bottom-up approach where people made commitments, but they made commitments that they felt uh, obligated to keep. The weakness of it, is, as it were, was those commitments didn't add up. <laughs> uh, they got us along, if they were all respected and implemented, they got us a long way, but they didn't get us nearly far enough. Certainly not to hold uh, what now the consensus position is, the uh, global average temperatures uh, too uh, close to um, not going too far above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And at the time we were shooting at two degrees Celsius, that's what we thought was going to be stable and safe. I think because of uh, uh, newer science, better science, it's clear that we have to do even better than two degrees. We have to get closer to 1.5 in order to have a, a sustainable, stable uh, planetary uh, atmosphere. And so the, those agreements didn't add up to that. So now that's what is going on this year, which is to enhance those agreements. President Biden has come forward with his pledge for the United States, which is uh, to reduce emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030. The Chinese have not moved uh, on their, uh, they've moved barely on their 2030 goal. Uh, President Xi has pledged a net zero economy by 2060. Europe, US, Japan, others have used 2050 as the benchmark. That's aggressive. Um, I, I don't think it's worth fighting about the 2050 or 2060 at this point. What it's worth fighting about is what they're going to do in the 2020s. Are they going to continue to build out coal-fired power? Are they going to start retiring it, uh, et cetera? And that's what Special Envoy Kerry, Secretary Kerry, and, and the president are working with other allies, people who want more ambition. There's a lot of pressure for China to move, but uh, it requires the United States being serious about its commitment. And that's riding a lot on the legislation that's currently pending on Capitol Hill. So let's get to that. So how do you think about the politics of climate change and which political messages resonate and what ones fall flat? Yeah, I think, uh, again, that's 
that's changed from a, the politics of restraint to a politics of optimism. You know, I think um, what you see the uh, leaders, and I think this this includes leaders at the at the city and state level who who stepped up when President Trump turned his back on the United States commitment on on, on climate. But you see it from coming from the uh, current administration, too, is that this can be a good news story. Doing the work of change and transformation can be a boon for job creation, for business development, for innovation, uh, for investment. And if we align the incentives right, which is what this legislation that's uh, pending is all about, if we get the incentives right, then the private sector will I think can can take off and and begin that cycle that virtuous cycle of uh, investment and innovation that could be really just not only uh, clean up the air deal with environmental injustice do the kinds of things that that uh, will produce better health but will get us on track to make our commitments on climate change as well. And uh, you know as we both know it's going to take trillions of dollars, uh, governments don't have the money, private sector does. So the key is what are the incentives for the private sector? How do we structure this? And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of markets in fighting climate change. You've been a champion of regulatory standard setting as a way to bring market forces to bear. How does this approach compare with carbon pricing and then I would like to get into a little bit of what ideas you have for reconciling the Biden carbon standards with European carbon pricing approach, yeah. which, which is going to be important. That's a great question, Hank. Uh, the, well, first of all, like I'm, I'm for getting done what you can get done. <laughs> that's that's my kind of <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Art of the possible. So if you ask if you know if you go to a Princeton economist. Uh, uh, whiteboard session on what's the most efficient way to, to do things. They'll tell you it's it's carbon tax, carbon pricing, et cetera. But if you can't pass that, it doesn't really work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm for doing the thing, the kinds of things that are going to be effective. And there's, there's, you know, there, we have some carbon pricing in the system already in the cap and trade system that we have in California, in the Northeast, et cetera. Um, and there's some ideas uh, in, in the current legislation for, for how to go a little bit further. But I think that um, don't underestimate the, the power of incentives. I think what you see and what Biden has put forward through, uh, particularly through uh, uh, support through the tax code for clean energy, for clean, uh, uh, for clean buildings and for clean transportation, will create, I think, a real boom of change and, and, and investment in the power sector, in the electric vehicle sector, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, you know, economists will tell you, well, that's not as, that's not as efficient as, on the economy overall. But I would say to them, the, the, uh, some of these sectors are very difficult to at least enact pricing that seems politically viable you're just not it the the price of uh of uh fuel for a car is just not sensitive enough that pricing is really going to drive you uh into electrification of vehicles and so more direct intervention direct support the use of uh, the authorities the president has uh, the ability to give consumers the incentive to buy electric vehicles, which they want to do, is going to be a more direct path to decarbonizing sec those sectors. I think so. We're going to end up with a mix. But you raised the question of, well, if the U.S. is using investments and standards, and Europe is using carbon pricing as the backbone of its system, how do you reconcile those? Uh, that comes to the fore when people begin to discuss border adjustment of products that where countries are producing them without taking account of the cost to the environment from carbon in their products, whether that's steel or cement or glass or plastics, etc. And the United States and uh, Europe are both 
uh, committed to creating a carbon border adjustment mechanism. But I think one of the things, and I've, I've spoken extensively with European colleagues on this, we can't get into a massive trade spat because we're both headed to the same destination. We we're both about on the same path for 2030, on the same path for 2050. Yes, we have different political systems, we have different mechanisms, but we have to align to get the world coming along with these two great blocks and these two great uh, economies. And if we do that, if we find common ground and maybe through a kind of a, a standard mechanism, then I think you'll see the rest of the world follow. You see India, China, you know, Brazil, the other economies, the big economies of the world, South Africa, Indonesia, they'll come along because there's such a pull from the EU, UK, uh, and the US aligned. So it's, it's going to be a tricky bit of diplomacy. We just seem to have decided that we, uh, we could stick our, our finger in the eye of the French recently. <laughs> but so it'll be a tricky bit of diplomacy, but I think it can be done. And I think that, uh, again, the people that, they, that I've talked to in the EU want to see it get done. And what makes this such a interesting but difficult problem is, as we saw when we were in the financial crisis of 2008, you know, these things are difficult, but if the crisis is immediate, it's easier to deal with it, right, than if it's long term. Right. And if it's national, it's easier to deal with it than if it's global. And so here you've got it's it's longer term, right, and it's uh, it's global. But let's get a little bit deeper on the largest carbon emitter, which is China, right? And it's a difficult to imagine an, an effective path for avoiding the worst climate outcomes without China being part of the solution. So given the fraught nature of US-China relations, what is the likelihood that our two nations will be able to cooperate effectively on climate change? And I'd like to talk about that and then you move next to more broadly. You know, you've been a close observer of China. You've worked well with China. How do you view the US-China challenge? Well, look, the overall bilateral relationship has deteriorated to the worst point probably since the Nixon administration. And the question is, on these global challenges, can you still find a way at least to communicate? I think we're in a different place than we were even just five years ago or six or seven years ago. We're destined to be in a place of strategic competition rather than full blown cooperation. I think the result of uh, Chinese uh, trade practices, IP theft, uh, the mercantilism, et cetera, means cooperation on technology development is going to be, I think, much, much more difficult than one might have imagined a decade ago. But that doesn't mean we can't compete for cleaner products and compete for selling those cleaner products uh, into the global economy. And what I think is going to be disastrous, though, is if we, we end up uh, in a context in which we can't keep open lines of communication about what each side's strategy is. And they'll push us and we'll push them and that's, that's okay. Uh, but that we, be, we need to be able to to at least assess the common threat of climate change, understand what each side's trying to do about it, how they're trying to pace their economic transformation. And uh, again, I think that we do have some tools, particularly working with the EU, uh, that can be influential in shaping what China is doing both domestically and certainly internationally. You know, one of the things, there, there's sort of two problems that we face with China. One is that they are not moving quick enough on, uh, they're, they're still building out coal fire power. They're not moving quickly enough to reduce their emissions from the power sector domestically. But they're also through the Belt and Road Initiative using their uh, considerable resources to finance coal expansion, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and Central Asia. 
And so I think the world probably at the G20 or a like forum, it's not going to just be, I think, the U.S. And, and China has to come together on having different pathways, uh, particularly for these countries that need the power the Vietnams, the Indonesias of the world, but have to do it in a cleaner way, uh, India, et cetera. And I think globally pressuring China to green the BRI, which they say they're committed to, which is to say, stop investing in coal, start investing in cleaner forms of, uh, of energy uh, through their overseas uh, financing and getting the United States more in the game doing more of that along with the international financial institutions is going to be, I think that's doable, but we have to have a channel of communication in order to get it done. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, if you look at the Belt and Road countries, they're 28% of global emissions today. And if something isn't done, you know, in seven or eight years, they'll have more emissions than even China. And China's practices outside of China are of great concern. And, and also building coal-fired power plants still in, in, in Northwest China. So there needs to be a real focus on that. I've also found in conservation, if we're looking at biodiversity, China's practices in China have been extraordinary in terms of preserving biodiversity and the forests and the coastal, but their impact on the ecosystem outside of China has been very harmful. And so getting them to focus there is going to be important. Now, most of our discussions that center on climate change these days are largely doom and gloom. Give our listeners a case for climate optimism. What gives you hope for the future? And John, I know you've already done a bit of that, talking about the opportunity for jobs and growth, right? And uh, the fact that we have a lot of what we need right now, it just takes a political will. But uh, give us some, if there's more hope for optimism here. Well, look, I, I, I think the real hope for optimism are the attitudes of younger people, <laughs> uh, more, than, more even than all the economic analysis about why it's going to be good for jobs and it's going to be good for air quality and it's going to be good uh, for the cause of environmental justice. I think it's that young people, they get it. They understand that people of our generation, Hank, have kind of screwed things up. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, they're going to have to step up to this. But I think they're, this is not just a national phenomena. It's a global phenomena that young people want to try to solve this problem. And I think they have the will and the capacity and the commitment to go about making the kind of changes that are necessary. And so the level of activism amongst young people across the globe is something that gives me hope. And I see it, you know, even in my own grandchildren, you know, that they're, they're climate warriors. And so that's a good thing. And they didn't get that from me. <laughs> and I don't even think they got it from their parents. I think they get it from understanding the world that they're, that they're going to have to live in. Absolutely. You know, and if you look at this issue, it's the ultimate issue in terms of generational uh, equity, right? Yeah. Because they're the ones that are going to bear the costs of the bad policies and practices of those that have gone before them. So let's, one last question, talking about young people. You spend a lot of time with students teaching at Georgetown. What career advice do you give them? And what advice would you give our younger listeners who want to uh, pursue a career in government and in politics? Yeah, that's a good question. I always I always start the answer by saying I'm the, uh, I'm probably the worst person in the world to give <laughs> advice about this because my career has been completely serendipitous. You know, I had ended up as the White House Chief of Staff, largely based on the fact that I was more curious than ambitious. I used curious earlier to describe Bill Clinton. Maybe that's something we share. I didn't have a career path in mind. I saw the goes back a little bit to my mother's urging that said, you've been given a lot. You know, we were pretty poor, so I wasn't sure what she was talking about, <laughs> but you've been given a lot. You need to give something back. And that's always stuck with me. But I, so uh, government was a somewhat natural path uh, for me. And I, I, as I said, I, I got involved in politics early, but I never really plotted my career. 
I was just always open to opportunity. What I tell uh, young people, uh, particularly, particularly young lawyers, is don't do something for a long time on the theory that you want to do something else, but you need to invest, make some money, get some capital, and then you could do it. Don't put it off. If you have an opportunity, take it. If you're curious about something, go for it. Uh, if it's going to make you happy, do it. If it's going to make you miserable, get out of it. <laughs> and, and, you know, life works out. Yep. You know, <laughs> it's funny. I have a different career than yours, but I sure didn't map mine out. I thought I was going to be a first to forest ranger. Then I was going to go to Oxford and study English. But I think doing things you're going to enjoy and do well. Now, John, thank you so much. You've covered a lot of ground. And uh, thanks for sharing your experience and wisdom with our listeners today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Hank. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.